This is Mrs. O'Neill for Chapter 4, Section 2, Structure of the Nuclear Atom. In this section, you're going to identify three subatomic particles and describe the structure of atoms according to this Rutherford model, which you kind of already know a little bit about because of watching that intro video last, um, last section. A simple but important device, first used by scientists in the late 19th century, the cathode ray tube would achieve its greatest fame as the picture tube of the common television set. Today, cathode ray tubes are found in TVs, computer monitors, and many other devices with electronic displays. But more than a hundred years ago, scientists were the only ones staring into the glow of the cathode ray tube. Their observations provided important evidence about the structure of atoms. So of course nowadays the cathode ray tube probably is not used as often because they were like bigger tubes and now everything is real tiny, but it still led to certain things about the atom. Just a joke, pause and read. Ha ha, hopefully thought that was funny. So here are the subatomic particles and there are two charts in your notes to fill out. I have the information here in the video. So you're going to fill out those two charts, then you're going to pause the video because there's a few questions that go along with those charts. Answer as many as you can and then of course play the video to check your answers. So before we begin though, again this is our atom, right? Uh, this is going to be called that electron cloud and if you see that the rings are slightly different colors, we're going to call those rings energy levels. Of course we have the nucleus and inside the nucleus we have two subatomic particles, the neutron and the proton. And of course in our electron cloud we have all the electrons. But then we're going to talk about specific energy levels is going to have specific electrons. So pause the video, fill in the chart. And down here I just like to have pictures, so hopefully you've paused and wrote down all the information. Again, pause, write down the information, and I like to have Rutherford there as just to show you who these people are. It's nice to always have a face with a name. Okay, so you should have paused and had those two charts filled out. Now, looking in your notes, or I should say the, 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 those two charts, try to come up with an answer. I believe there's like five or six questions. So it says, what can you conclude about the mass of the electron compared to the proton and neutron? So we're doing a little bit of comparison here now. So I'm going to go through each uh, question before uh, you pause and, and uh, try to answer it, but I'm going to underline what you should really be focusing on. So number two, so now we're going to conclude um, or talk about the mass of the proton compared to the neutron. So number one, we're comparing the mass of the electron to the proton and neutron. And number two, we're comparing the mass of the proton compared uh, to the neutron. Three, where's the most then mass of that atom located? So again, understanding one and two, you should be able to understand or give me an answer for number three. Remember, there's two main parts to the atom. So I'm either looking for the nucleus, because that's one main part of the atom, or the electron cloud. That's going to be that second part of the atom. So where, which one of those would give you the most mass of the atom? Number four, think about what's inside that nucleus and what charge would it have and why. And number five, what would be the main difference then between the electron clouds and energy levels? I already said it in this video and again, it's written in that chart. So now pause the video, come up with an answer and then continue playing to, uh, to check your answers. Hopefully you paused, you wrote down an answer, had some kind of thinking going on there, and now let's see if you can analyze it correctly. So number one's answer, right? So the mass of that electron has the least mass of all three. How about the mass of the proton compared to the neutron? Well, those two are the same. So protons and neutrons equal the same mass, where the electrons are a heck of a lot less. Hopefully that makes sense, especially we're dealing with those mass numbers. Think about that exponent um, having that negative um, value. Number three, then most of the mass of the atom is located in the nucleus. If our protons and neutrons are heavy and they're in the nucleus, then that's where most of the mass of the atom is. 
What charge then does the nucleus have and the Y? Well, it has a positive charge. Hopefully you got that, right? Po so, but now the Y, because it has positive protons and neutral neutrons. So a positive and a neutral would make it positive. Number five, so what's the difference then between the electron cloud and energy levels? Uh, just want to remind you, like again, I said before, and it's in your chart, the electron clouds are going to have all the electrons in that atom, but energy levels are going to contain specific electrons. And we're going to talk um, later on about where the, uh, how many electrons are in each of those energy levels. So I thought this was interesting. Pause. Hopefully you looked at this and read it over and was like, wow, yourself, right? How much, uh, and again, this is just a comparison, but how much a proton weighs versus how many, how much an electron weighs and what that comparison would be like. So here's the parts of the atom. So let's make sure we understand the parts of the atom and if there's any charges associated with it. So in your notes, you have basically the same thing and the arrows, excuse me, are exactly in the same spot. So, do we know what this E is representing? Hopefully you got that it represents an electron and it has a negative charge. So if you want to wait until I go through the whole thing and then pause and write everything in, great. Or you can kind of pause and play, pause and play along the way. It's up to you. The P, hopefully you understand, means proton and that has a positive charge. And that little N, N inside this darkened area is going to be the neutron. And of course, that doesn't have a charge. These arrows up here are pointing to the specific energy levels. And of course, again, this ring or the middle of the atom is the nucleus. And now you know that that nucleus has a positive charge. And this down here, it's kind of hard to understand, but really I'm trying to encompass all of this area outside the nucleus. And that's going to be called the electron cloud. So again, at this point, if you didn't already fill in these blanks along the way, pause and make sure you get that information written down in your notes. So here's a nice flow chart. I'm actually going to say pause and write all the information down. Hopefully this makes sense, but I like flow charts just like Mr. Bozeman Science does. And hopefully this is a little bit of some stuff that you've learned in the past and some stuff that you're going to find out in the future. So I did give you the first letter of each of the boxes. And then again, you might also want to write in these little extra things uh, as well. I did not put that in your notes. That's something I thought either you'd want to or not want to add to your notes. Um, um, that's going to be all up to you. So pause and make sure you have uh, the flow chart written out. Okay, so and I believe down here as well, this was a little tricky for me to make in your notes. Um, so I think I have it coming down from the energy levels, but you can also kind of connect it with the paired electrons. So those kind of go together. So I love my little jokes. Hee <laughs> hee. Helium, helium. Get it, get it. All right, so let's understand a little bit about this cathode ray tube and how J.J. Thomas used it to figure out that electron. So here's a picture of the cathode ray tube. Really, it's a vacuum tube, but inside the tube, we have a negative charged plate and we have a positive charged plate, and we have it connected to some wires um, so we can give it a charge, right? We can give it, we can turn it on, basically. So he also then used a magnet. That's what was neat. So not only did he just see this cathode ray tube and the light shining, these particles shining through the cathode ray, but then he also used a magnet, and that's, that's what really said, oh yeah, there's such things as electrons because of the attraction to that magnet. So again, those are electric plates, um, and again, he just kind of put the, the things in here with the positive and negative, and now you see that the there's a bend in there. So this I found a little bit uh, easier to understand if I kind of go through it step by step. So here's our cathode ray tube. It's a vacuum tube, right? So it's vacuum sealed. These things are called electrodes because they're positively charged and negatively charged. So negative, positive charge. And it's connected kind of like to a battery so you can kind of turn it on and off. So what happens is he ran a current through the vacuum tube, right? This cathode ray tube. So he turned it on. So what's going to happen to the current? Well, what happens is by passing the electron current, this beam, really this beam of light, appear to move from the negative end to the positive end, right? Just straight across. That should make sense, right? Positive is going to be connected to the, uh, I'm sorry, negative is going to be attracted to the positive and it's going to be kind of keep rotating around. However, now he has the, adds this electric field. He adds what's called like that magnet on the tube. Now what's going to happen to that current? 
it bends. So he discovered that these these this this beam of light really has moving pieces to them, and they're negatively charged, right? Because we have the positive on top, right? So this must be attracted to the positive on the top, right? So this is negative moving this way. It was connected to the positive here, but now that we have this magnet, it's actually really attracted to the positive. So this beam of light must be negatively charged particles, and they can move, right? Because they they kind of bent their shape. So we call this the Thompson Atomic Model, where you have an atom and you have all these negative charges around it. I like to think of a chocolate chip cookie, right? So if we have this chocolate chip cookie, we have um, we have the dough and then we have the chocolate chips inside. So the Th Thomas's model said, okay, we have the, the atom and it's all filled with these electrons. So that was kind of the beginning of finding these subatomic particles. So how about Rutherford's uh, gold foil experiment? So here we have again we have this 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 uh, block of wood basically lead block we have this uranium and we're going to shoot it through this gold foil and then you have this fluorescent screen to see where these particles are going to hit so this is what he thought should happen he thought all of them were going to just go straight through right according to J.J. Thomas uh, the the <coughs> excuse me the atom is mostly empty space so it's going to go right through so this is what he thought. Okay. If the atom is mostly empty space, particles are going to go straight through, right? Those electrons are just going to be there and kind of go all over the place. However, so what's going on here? The particles, all of them don't go through. Now, still mostly go through, which is going to be something to keep in mind. But now some of them are hitting something in this gold foil, something in these atoms to make them be deflected off. So this is where he discovered that nucleus. There was this hard center where these atoms, or I'm sorry, these particles, these particles would hit this center, this nucleus, so hard, but the nucleus was like, you can't go anywhere, and kind of shoots them off to the side. So not only did he discover that it was a nucleus inside, but he also discovered that they were positively charged, because again, it wasn't attracted to it, it kind of pushed it away. So again, here's another look at that gold foil experiment and what happened and where those particles were going. Uh, those alpha particles. Uh, again, same thing if we're looking at multiple uh, atoms. Again, these are atoms of that gold foil um, inside. Okay, so what did he come up with? Well, he came up with because most of those alpha particles went through the atom, it's mostly made up of empty space, which we kind of already knew from J.J. Thomas, but now he's the one who discovered that nucleus, that middle part of the atom and that it is positively charged. So here's the modern view. Uh, again, it kind of looks a little different than we're used to, right? But the atom really has two areas. Uh, we have this uh, nucleus in the middle, and then we have this electron cloud around the outside. And it's like a big fuzzball. I thought this was interesting. You can pause and read. And so let's take that quickie quiz. Pause, read, come up with an answer, and then play to see if it's correct. Hopefully, oops, sorry, hopefully you got molecule as an answer. Number two. Hopefully you got C as an answer. Number three. Now, before you answer, it's asking about the volume of the atom, not the mass, right? You already answered most of the mass of the atom is occupied, but now this is the volume. What part of the atom is the biggest volume and what subatomic particle would be in that area? Hopefully you came up with the electron cloud has the biggest space of the atom, right? The nucleus is a really small center, but the uh, electron cloud is a lot of space around it. And what's occupied in them is the electrons. Oh, I forgot to put the end. Sorry. The end. All right. See you in class.